extraordinary achievement. There were 161 names on the list, and in the end, uh, all of them were accounted for. They didn't all go to jail, but all of them, one way or another, were ticked off. And many of them died, uh, but more than half the rest were uh, picked up and face trial and, uh, and convicted. So in terms of the history of the enforcement of international humanitarian law, it is unique. Uh, even Nuremberg doesn't really come close. Most of the people they were looking for were in their jails after the fall of Nazi Germany anyway. Um, so in the big picture, it is an extraordinary historic achievement. When you start to focus in on the details, it was an incredible screw up. Um, and, and that was the reason why it took 18 years from the founding of the court to the last uh, arrest of Goran Hadzic to have accomplished uh, something which could have largely been achieved. I don't think there's any doubt in the first couple of years after the war where Bosnia was garris garrisoned by this enormous NATO-led force, 64,000. Uh, it was the most heavily policed place on earth. But the problem was that these soldiers and their commanders were not interested in arresting these people. And they made what was clear later to have been an elemental state, they saw peace and justice as being subjective. You had, a, had one or the other. And the commanders of uh, I-4 and then S-4 described going after these guys as mission creep. We're here to keep the peace. If we start going after these people, then all sorts of people are going to be upset. They're going to start <coughs> shooting at us. The Americans, the Europeans expected to take casualties when they went into Bosnia. Um, they thought it was far more fraught with danger than it actually was. So they did everything in their power to avoid arresting these people. The, 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 the rule of thumb was if you came across pitwits, people uh, indicted for war crimes, which was the, the military acronym, if, if you came across them, in the course of your duties, then you could arrest them. But of course, the, the various national forces made every effort to make sure that they didn't come across them in the course of their duties, to, to the point of when Karadzic and his entourage would go past the, uh, the Italians who, who controlled a certain junction outside Pade, they would turn their backs so as not to see them. So an enormous, an obvious opportunity was, was missed in those couple of years. Now, that opportunity having been missed, then it took a long time. But belatedly, it did become a major, major effort. I think that's one of the surprises to me on writing this book, is that it was a huge effort. It was the biggest deployment of special forces anywhere in the world before 9-11. If you talk to anyone from Navy SEALs, Delta Force, SAS, and their Dutch and French and German counterparts who were uh, in active service at that point, all of them would have taken part uh, in this, who have done a tour looking for these people. Um, but the, uh, and so you had this first section, this first phase, the NATO phase of Bosnia, where they were able to pick up a lot of people, um, but these were sort of so-called low-hanging fruit. The big names, the kind of bold-faced names of Balkan war crimes, once the manhunt had begun, had fled into Serbia, Croatia, were harbored there by sympathetic regimes. And so then you had the, the next phase, which was intense pressure on reluctant governments in, in Zagreb and Belgrade. Uh, you had Tuzman and, and uh, on one side, and then Kosman, you say, in Belgrade, who 
who reluctantly gave up small fry under intense economic pressure. But the third and last phase, the end game, was all about political change. Political change in Croatia, political change in Belgrade, not just at the top, but the key battles were inside the intelligence agencies in both countries. And it was only when those battles had been resolved and in, in Croatia it came to a standoff in the streets of Zagreb between different factions of the intelligence agencies, the main intelligence agencies. Uh, but it was only once those internal struggles uh, had been resolved that you get the last, the, the big fish uh, were picked up. Uh, Karadzic was, was picked up only two or three days after uh, Bia, the, the Serbian intelligence agency, was put under new management dossier was there all along, it just needed someone new in charge. So finally it took political change to bring these people in, people in. And so overall uh, at the end the, the, the open dossier that was created by the creation of the ICTY actually had a momentum of its own that by its nature had brought itself to a conclusion it refused to close the dossier until everyone on the list was accounted for. And so this is the main achievement, that all these people face some kind of justice. And so as we said, there's another question of what kind of justice did, was then delivered, what kind of justice did they find once they went in front of the, the bench. And of course there, that's a much more complicated, mixed picture. As you go to countries that were formerly Yugoslavia now, you will be hard pressed to find someone who's entirely satisfied with what the ICTY did. And so there is this element of glass half full, half empty, empty about the legacy of the ICTY. And uh, even I believe that even I'm afraid the, the, the fiercest, fiercest critics among say, the victims, mothers of would nevertheless find it unthinkable that the ICT had never come into being and that Karadzic and Radic were still at liberty. Um, and so inevitably it is this mixed picture. I, I just read a brief extract, extract from the book. It's actually pretty much the end of the book where I try and um, sum up what the tribunal meant in a historical context. And this is what I say. Some justice was done. A few score of the guilty stood before the dock and were made to listen while the survivors recounted the bare facts. The convicted were deprived of some years of liberty. It's not justice's fault that this appears so paltry in face of such atrocious crime. This is all it had to offer. That and a reasonable stab at the truth. Serge Bramitz, the ICTY's last chief prosecutor, said, Without the tribunal, there wouldn't be a database of seven million documents which very clearly give the history of the conflict so that no one can deny <coughs> that crimes have taken place and that genocide has been committed. Resurgent nationalists in, in the states of the former Yugoslavia are covering over the truth now of what happened with a thick layer revisionism and denial, but the meticulous record of the tribunal with its seven million documents can't be buried forever, nor can the demand for justice for humanity's worst crime. The Yugoslav manhunt showed that the judgments of an international court could be enforced. It showed that given time, resources and political will, war criminals could ultimately be tracked down and held to account. It set a benchmark against which all future efforts will be judged. I think that's all I'm trying to do. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, when we're talking about the book, you talk to a lot of um, CIA people and um, all kinds of military and intelligence services uh, people. Um, those must be difficult to get to talk to, but even more difficult um, from my perspective is probably the Serbian side of um, intelligence agencies and, and all those um, 
well, I wouldn't say spooks, but um, and they are a sort of political um, influence. Who was the biggest surprise um, you got that you asked to talk to and actually agreed? Or the, the kind of biggest uh, fish that you hooked to get to talk to them that you didn't think you would get? Uh, they're all difficult because by their nature, so special forces and intelligence are bound never to talk, mm -hmm. not you know, in, until death. And so I became you know, accustomed to, to uh, a great amount of rejection. But I would say on, on balance, about a quarter of the people I approached through contacts of contacts of contacts, agreed to talk. And, and I suppose the ones I was happiest about finding and thought getting to talk were people who took place, uh, took part in operations. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, both the Delta Force and SAS, a, a guy uh, from the German, um, uh, the German uh, Special Force, newly formed Special Forces Group. Uh, and also the Polish colonel from the newly formed Grom, the Polish Special Forces, who led the first um, the the first arrest on behalf of the ICTY, uh, which is one of my favourite stories because it was a sort of pickup team of a, an American diplomat, American prosecutor, a British Bobby, a Czech uh, homicide detective, and this Polish colonel, and they all got together and decided we're going to do this, even though none of their governments were in favor of it. Mm -hmm. And they got the, the ball rolling. So then, and on, on the, I guess what helped me most on the Serbian side was Mickey Rackage, who was Boris, Boris Tadic's sort of eminence grise, and he was, he was dying. Um, and he wanted this story to come out because he believed very strongly that this is a matter of individual guilt and not the collective guilt of Serbs. Mm -hmm. So he was driven to, to tell the story and, and, and helped me a lot from the Serbian perspective. And uh, we talked about this a bit already and it's also linked to the, to the fact that all these uh, military and intelligence operations uh, were uh, connected. And the biggest revelation that you got while writing the book, you just uh, touched on it, that it was uh, so many um, that it was such a big operation, all the people involved went on to do, um, I think even the CIA rendition came, so that the uh, Czech mm -hmm. was the first kind of rendition. Mm -hmm. um, was that, um, did you not expect uh, that when you started? Uh, I don't know what to expect, I think. I, I mean, the whole thing was a, a revelation to me because you know, you're looking at from, uh, from the outside and you're most aware of what they're not doing. They hadn't got carriages, they hadn't got luggage. It was quite shocked for me how, how much they were trying. And it just shows it is really hard to find individuals when they are, you know, fish in their own sea. Um, and, but they also went about it completely the wrong way. They went, take it, take it to the, the American first. They went in big and they had very little understanding. Uh, one of the Special <coughs> Forces commanders there uh, who went on to run Special Said to, said to me, we had everything we had, you know, the manpower, we had the equipment, but we didn't understand the terrain. Uh, and that was really, came home to me when I was talking to the former CIA station chief from Sarajevo during this period that I was interested in, post-war period. And he kept on talking about nomadic uh, carriages. And I thought, you've been there for years and you, your main job was to um, find these people and you can't even pronounce their names. Uh, it made me re realize, you know, we, we hold up CIA and PIA uh, to be these all-powerful agencies, and, and yet, you know, there was a very small um, core of knowledge on which they were working. Mm. Uh, talking about this, people who uh, work every day with something and still don't recognize it, uh, one of the favorite parts in my book uh, and in your book, um, for me, was that uh, when they arrested Karadzic, it turned out that um, the Interpol, I think, liaison uh, that was tasked with finding uh, Mladic and Karadzic 
uh, who's living in the same building with you, may, maybe, uh, maybe even across the hall, and who's greeting Ragan Dadic, the nice faith healer in, the, in, her, uh, in, her, um, in her hallway uh, every day, and didn't see that this was the same guy whose picture apparently up started up when, uh, when her computer started. Um, but there was one very smart officer from the Serbian intelligence officers when sent to this faith healer, um, remarked, well, you know, if you shave the beard and take off the top knot, might it not be Karadzic himself? And I was wondering, did you manage to speak to that man? And why is he the only one from all the people who are looking at it from here to have this brilliant idea of like, it, it might be him? Because the, the story was um, they caught him because Karadzic's brother called a phone that Dragan Dabic answered, and they were wondering why this hard-drinking Serb was suddenly interested in a kind of alternative faith healer with electromagnetic powers to make the, the sperm swim faster, and tracked it and started looking at him, but they thought that he was somehow connected to Karadzic, but it took one beautiful <coughs> guy to look at him and say, we should get him, a sh we should shave him, and Karadzic is under there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good good thing. The uh, success of the disguise is that when you were going to see a faith healer, you know, who's best known for, you know, if you put your you know, hand near your genitals, your, your sperm uh, supposedly move around faster. Um, you don't expect to see a, a, a walk around. You're not expecting to see, you know, the Europe, maybe the world's most wanted man. The difference when this, this guy again, Bia guy, went along. Uh, was that he was looking at him in the context of Karadzic, mm -hmm. but no one else looked at him in the top context or with any expectation of seeing Karadzic there. And he, you know, famously went to the, uh, you know, the Lula Kucha, the man house, the, the local bar where he was, where he lived in, in New Belgrade, and there was there was a picture of Karadzic on the wall, and he sat in the middle of this bar and played the good like the, the, the single string fiddle. And, and no one made the connection. They thought, what a, what a, you know, what a great old guy. He can really play that good luck. And no one made the connection because you can't, you know, you're, you're, not, it, you're not expecting to see it. It's only when you look at it in a different way. You're looking for carriages and you look at them and you, you know, you look at it <coughs> now, knowing that it's carriages all along. You look at pictures of that and that is the of course. Since the book um, came out, we saw the conviction of Ragnar Karadzic for 40 years, and it's also saw the uh, controversial acquittal of uh, Vojislav Sesho, the Serbian, uh, I guess the AFP uh, description was always Serbian firebrand politician. Mm. Um, does that, um, did, have you since been in touch with um, people, do you think it changes the mood in the region, or is it just another, um, you know, some ha glass half full, half empty, um, you know, I think with Karadzic, you know, there, there was an expectation that Jim would be light. But then the idea that you could measure the sentence put on him in years, uh, I think, was shocking to, to many people. Uh, and with Shesho, it just seems crazy, you know, that the uh, uh, they seem to look again at various matters that will happen in Croatia and Bosnia. You know, they weren't massacres, they weren't systematic killings, whereas previous cases in which the previous cases had been the police. And yeah, they just, uh, I'll just uh, clarify for people who don't follow the tribunal, maybe like we do. Sesho, the voice of Sesho, Serbian politician, accused of hate speech and also for crimes that um, militias kind of financed and called up by him and committed in Bosnia and Croatia. I think um, the main thing about the judgment that he was acquitted maybe is um, in that sense irrelevant, but the judges decided in the acquittal to uh, kind of go over a, a number of things um, and say that there were not systematic uh, crimes against humanity in uh, Bosnia and Croatia, which uh, kind of, n well not nullified, but it kind of ignored um, 20, 30 other judgments by the tribunal proving just that. So the big controversy surrounding Sesho is maybe not that that guy was acquitted, but that the judges at the time kind of decided to say that crimes against humanity did not happen in Bosnia and that people um, who were driven out of their homes kind of uh, voluntarily got on the bus um, 
and that this, and both in Serb forces, were actually doing a humanitarian thing by allowing these people to flee their homes. Um, I think we'll now move on to the discussion. I, I want to say first that uh, Julian's wonderful book, which really reads like a thriller, um, is on sale uh, after the show for a special discount if you're interested, and I'm sure Julian can be convinced to sign it as well. Um, for the discussion, 